here. Uh, so I'm delighted and honored uh, to introduce our first speaker of the year, uh, Dr. Stephanie Hansen, who is the distinguished uh, member of the technical staff uh, in the ICF target design group at Sandia National uh, Laboratories, uh, where she studies the atomic scale behavior of atoms in extreme environment uh, and develops atomic uh, scale sorry, uh, spectroscopic equation of state and transport models to help predict and diagnose the behavior of high energy density uh, plasma. Uh, she's a recipient of uh, an early career grant from the Department of Energy and also was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2017. And she was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2019. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Fred. And Happy New Year. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I can see the chat. So if you have questions, please feel free to unmute or type them in the chat. Uh, this is kind of a whirlwind survey of some of the high energy density science that we do at Sandia and some of the atomic physics model development and model applications that I and my close collaborators are doing. I might um, turn off my camera just to save bandwidth if I can, um, but I wanted to be here for a moment to wave and say hello. So I will stop the video and continue. Um, so this is a talk that has contributions from many people. And what I want to do here is, is give a brief introduction to extreme states of matter from the perspective of modeling requirements and physical phenomena. And then talk a little bit about how we create hot dense matter and focus on um, efforts at Sandia on the Z machine. Then we'll take a deep dive into atomic modeling, talking about some recent developments generating self-consistent um, atomic models that incorporate the effects of, of squishing plasmas together of high densities and pressures, how you generate detailed X-ray spectra and incorporate non-equilibrium effects. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about opportunities at Sandia, internships and fellowships, and hopefully some of you will join us. We'd love it if you do. So when we talk about matter at extreme conditions, we're talking about conditions that span an enormous range of densities, temperatures, and uh, physical phenomena. Thinking about pressure, of course, to very first order, it's the product of density, temperature, and a Z star, which is the average ionization of a plasma. But you can get, so you can get to high pressures in multiple ways. You can go to high density plasmas. These are strongly coupled. The ions are very close together. And even if it's not very hot, you can reach very high pressures with degenerate electrons. So you find plasmas like this in planetary interiors, in ICF um, experiments. And to get to those conditions, you can do ramp or shock compression to get you to a couple of times solid density. But again, your temperatures don't have to be that hot in order to get high pressures. To generate those conditions, you can use optical lasers or you can use pulse power, which is what we'll focus on today. And to model these, we really have fabulous state-of-the-art models that are called density functional theory molecular dynamics models. Sometimes they're also called Kohn, Schaum, DFT. And those are restricted to something called local thermodynamic equilibrium or LTE, which will come up later in the talk. But they're really, really reliable. They do a great job getting bonding. They can get ionic structures of different lattice types. The approach that we're taking today is an average atom model that has some of those same qualities, but it's not a multi-center model. So it also has some deficiencies, but its real advantage is that it's super fast. And so it's good for impatient people like me. If you take a different route to high pressure, and you go to high temperatures, 
carrier plasmas are modestly coupled, but they can be highly ionized and they can reach very high pressures through um, just the motion of the atoms, not that they're close together or Fermi degenerate, but they're just moving fast. Applications of high temperature plasmas or regions where you find these are things like stellar astrophysics, um, also fusion plasmas. I'll talk in this talk about magneto inertial fusion. And the way you get there is through a shock transfer of energy to ions and there, therefore to electrons or bulk kinetic motion of a plasma or material that could even be compressional, or you could do direct heating with optical or X-ray free electron lasers. Again, I'll focus on pulse power in this talk. When you're modeling these plasmas, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, Burkhardt, of course, does fabulous path integral Monte Carlo. I'm not an expert in this, so I'll talk more about a different approach called collisional radiative models. And these are nice because they're inherently non-LTE and they have a lot of electronic configurations rather than a lot of ionic configurations. The modeling approach that I'll talk about today is in the same spirit where it develops multi-configuration electronic configurations from the average atom wave functions and then benchmark those against um, more traditional non-LTE models. So we create high energy density matter on the earth, terrestrially, um, in experimental facilities that compress energy in space and time. On the Z machine, for example, we store 20 megajoules in capacitor banks, uh, those go through transmission lines and deliver about one megajoule to a target that's about a centimeter um, in volume in hundreds of nanoseconds. So that's actually pretty high efficiency. We have 4% efficiency from the capacitor banks to the target, and we get pretty high energy densities, millijoules per cubic centimeter, and high, high power densities, terawatts per cubic centimeter. On NIF, of course, and other laser facilities, you can deliver similar amounts of energy to similar length scales on similar time scales. The efficiency is not as high as pulse power. However, because the time scales are shorter, because you're not running along transmission lines, you're going at the speed of light, uh, the power densities can be much higher. Um, XFELs are also fascinating for high energy density science and matter at extreme conditions. Because even though they're delivering much less energy, millijoules now instead of megajoules, they do it in uh, femtoseconds. And so you can reach extraordinary power densities, delivering this small amount of energy to very small volumes in very short times. Let's talk a little bit about volts power because again, it's an efficient way to deliver large amounts of energies to relatively large samples. And the sample size can matter if you want uniform uh, samples that are not super difficult to image. So this is a picture of the Z machine. It's kind of a cool building if you've never been there. I'd love for you to come visit, especially when COVID eases a bit, if it does. Because it's a huge building and there's like a Olympic size swimming pool full of water uh, that stores the transmission line surrounded by tanks of oil. And you have a hat in there, which we don't allow. Um, it would be about that big. And when we shoot, and we shoot about once a day, um, no more than once a day, uh, there's a loudspeaker and somebody starts counting down the capacitors charging up. And so they get to 10 kilovolts and 20 kilovolts. And over a couple of minutes, a minute or two, it reaches 20 um, or 80 megavolts and 22 megajoules stored. And then um, the machine fires. The current is compressed in space and time to deliver 20 mega amps of current to our target. So the Marx generators release over a couple of microseconds. The pulse forming lines compress this um, in time and deliver it compressed in space to a target chamber. Of course, there is nobody in there at the time Z fires. And then the ground shakes um, and we create plasmas. And what happens to the target in the target chamber? Well, it turns into slag. 
it really is like exploding a stick of dynamite in a target chamber. So they're cool experiments. Um, it's fun to work near the Z facility because even in my building, which is a fair distance away, you know when Z fires. And what it does with all of that current is it delivers energy through the J cross B force. So of course we know from undergraduate physics that um, currents running in parallel wires make those wires want to go together. And we use the same physics to drive a variety of targets on the Z facility. Uh, we have the drive current runs one way, it, it creates its own magnetic field and then the J cross B force can implode something. So you can do compression experiments. And because the magnetic drive pressure goes as the current squared over the radius squared, you can deliver very high pressures, megabar or gigabar pressures, if you run 26 mega amps at a millimeter smaller radius. And the, unlike ablating plasmas, like on NIF, of ICS experiments, the pressure continues to increase as the implosion proceeds. Of course, you have to control for instabilities and that's pretty difficult in cylindrical geometry, all sorts of other considerations, but it's kind of a cool different approach from lasers. You can also, instead of starting at a millimeter, start with like a wire array that has a radius of 50 millimeters and that starts imploding pretty slowly. The pressures are much lower, the velocities are much slower, but when it stagnates, when it hits the other side of the array, it stagnates on axis and it can create enormous amounts of x-rays. You can also run the current in different directions, one on a light thing and one on a heavy thing. And my arrows are not indicative of the mass of the thing, but the, this sends one of those things, the lighter thing, off to smack something. So you could put a sample here and you could smack it with what we call a flyer plate and that can generate megabar shocks. So to put these ideas into more of a physical concept um, and to outline some of the things that I'll talk about here, um, I've replaced those schematic diagrams with diagrams from this really nice paper from Dan Sinars and others at Sandia that surveys some of the experiments that we do. The dynamic um, materials experiments, that have this uh, flyer plate geometry where you're sending current in opposite directions to send something off to smack a sample. Um, again, give us opportunities to do shock compression, ramp compression uh, to generate pressures up to 10 megabars. Wire ray implosions can generate terawatts of X-rays. That's more power than the entire world electrical grid. And those X-rays can be used for uh, lab astro experiments that I'll talk a little bit about. And finally, we can do fusion where we compress um, fusion fuel and we can reach gigabars of pressure because we compress it to very small radius and reach kilojoules of yield, uh, DT equivalent yields. So I included some stuff on dynamic materials properties, even though I'm not a dynamic materials properties expert. Um, when, when you're taking a flyer plate and smacking a sample, you also need to have kind of a witness that you know how it behaves. It's called a standard so that you can measure how shock propagates through that and how your sample mediated that. And the typical um, standards are things like quartz or, or sapphire. But if you want to get to really high pressures, you need heavier standards. And so recently, ramp experiments have enabled us to use gold and platinum that are accurate standards up to 10 megabar. So that's kind of exciting written up here. With that, you can do things like Eugonio experiments to figure out where the triple point of materials are, where it melts, where it coexists in these different complex phases written up in science. Actually, that was quite a while ago, 2008. And finally, we can do combined shock ramp experiments that give us information about uh, insulator metal transitions. For example, in deuterium, if you know where 
uh, deuterium will turn into a metal, you can get things like uh, hydrogen rain. And it tells you a lot about what happens in giant planets like um, Saturn and, and Jupiter. When we implode wire arrays and generate these terawatts of X-rays, uh, we also do astrophysical experiments. So the, probably the most famous one is when we put iron foil encased in, in a beryllium bun uh, on top of the X pinch. As the thing is imploding, it generates X-rays that heat up that foil to a couple hundred electron volts. And when it stagnates, it gives you a very bright backlighter that's a continuum over a lot of X-ray energies. And it backlights this preheated iron foil or oxygen foil or chromium. We've done a bunch of different elements. And you can measure the absorption and extract an opacity. These are called monochromatic opacities. I never really understood that because they're measuring a lot of different colors. Um, but they're measuring it with high fidelity. So you have a really good resolution in the measurement that you make. And you can compare it to the kind of collisional irradiated models that I introduced at the beginning. And in fact, we found that they don't agree very well. And that's, that's an ongoing and interesting puzzle. You can also put a bunch of experiments around the side of this stagnating plasma and do other kinds of investigations. So if you put a foil, we've done silicon, uh, you can get that to expand and heat up. Uh, and it's a photoionized plasma, really relevant to accretion disks in astrophysics. And again, we make these exquisite spectroscopic measurements and compare them against uh, the best models that we have in the community. Or you could put a hydrogen gas cell or a neon gas cell, and you can look at Things like spectral line formation in white dwarf photospheres that are useful for cosmochronology. Uh, you can look at the details of photoionizing plasma kinetics so you can see things ionize and reach equilibrium. And there are some references if, if you're interested in any of these. And the last kind of experiment I'll talk about is this compressional one where we use the compressional J cross B force to create a gigabar fusion plasma. This concept called maglev combines inertial and magnetic confinement. And like all ICF schemes, it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg uh, scheme, right? Where you, you start with a beryllium cylinder uh, that you pre-magnetize by firing off a totally different capacitor bank to in, uh, through some coils that generate a Z, a magnetic field in the Z direction. That does two things. It keeps the plasma hot by um, slowing down heat conduction radially as it implodes. And it, that stagnation, uh, traps the charged fusion products that are born going outside radially through the plasma. Then you preheat the plasma with a laser. Um, and this, I know that some folks here have, Marissa has done some cool work on. Um, understanding how this works. Uh, and then you uh, implode it with the J cross B force of the Z machine. So this implosion, because it's on a preheated plasma, doesn't have to be very fast. And so it can be relatively stable compared to the faster schemes of traditional um, ICF. And you end up with about a centimeter long column of three keV plasma. It's not nearly as dense as what you get at NIF. But because you have this additional confinement mechanism, you can actually confine a good fraction of your um, charged particles. And you can get yields that are the equivalent of 10 to the 15 dT. The other nice thing about working at Sandian is Part of the key because it again has all of these um, exquisite X-ray spectrometers, and we can use those to diagnose what's happening in these plasmas. So, for example, we can take an image that shows you this long, thin stagnation column, but we can also take a spectrum that shows you, hey, there is iron 
that has reached the helium-like charge state, which means this plasma is pretty hot. Where does the iron come from? It comes from impurities in the beryllium that form a little mixed layer in between the fusion fuel and the cold beryllium that remains in the liner. And we know that there's a lot of cold beryllium remaining in the, in the liner because we see these cold K-alpha lines from neutral iron um, that are photo that are the result of photoionization from these hot X-rays from the stagnating plasma. So just looking at this spectrum tells you there's strong gradients. There is hot multi-KEV plasma and there is cold few EV plasma. And we also observe, because my colleague Eric Harding builds great spectrometers, some really interesting redshifts in these fluorescence lines that I'll talk about at the end. So let's turn to models. And again, this is kind of a survey. I don't intend for any of this to be rigorous or this is just hey, here's some things I'm pointing at. And if you're interested, I can point you to people who can help you understand them or, or engage you and work on them. Because this modeling all of these conditions with atomic scale models, which are the, really the simplest models you can do, they're not even the multi-scale models that we use for hydrodynamics um, target design. It's challenging. And it's challenging because you have to meet all of the requirements that models need at high density. That is, your electrons have to be fully degenerate. You have to have some picture of pressure ionization, what happens when you squish electronic orbitals close to other electronic orbitals. You have to know what the ion distribution is, as well as the electron distribution. You have to know how collisions and other density effects impact your orbitals. And again, models like TDDFT do this really, really well but they're really, really expensive. And you also have to do everything that models at high temperatures are good at, which is having ex extensive electronic configurations, a real accounting for thermal excitation and ionization that you get at high temperatures, and an ability to uh, account for non-equilibrium or non-LTE effects. So these are things like a radiation temperature that's different from your electron temperature hot electrons, so if you have a non-thermal distribution of radiation or electrons, um, you have to be able to account for that. And you want your model to give you um, a couple of different kinds of outputs. You want equation of state, because those are really critical for hydro modeling. You want transport coefficients, like electrical and thermal conductivities, stopping powers. And you want radiative properties, like opacities so that you can get observable, like uh, emission spectrum or an absorption spectrum or a scattering spectrum from X-ray Thomson scattering. Because those are how you connect with experiments. If you can't make this direct connection, um, you're left filling in some gaps and those lines are not always easy to draw. And again, if you can get all of this stuff, you can put it into tables that you can use in a radiation hydrodynamic simulation. But it's especially hard to do that for non-LTE because instead of tabulating on density and temperature, now you're tabulating on density, temperature, and the radiation field. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of challenges in doing this, um, which means it's lots and lots and lots and lots of fun to try. So. What we're trying to do uh, with a group of about 10 people who are delights to work with um, is to take a pretty old concept actually of an average atom. And it was developed in the 20s and 30s this, by Metropolis and Teller and others. This idea that you divide space into ion spheres. So each atom has its own ion sphere. And then you guess a potential. And then you solve the Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation to get wave functions in that potential. And the wave functions will be, you know, nothing surprising. 1s states like to be near the nucleus. 2s and 2p states are a little farther out. You obey all of your degeneracy and exclusion principles. And then you populate those wave functions 
according to a Fermi occupation factor that then gives you a new electron density. And that electron density with the Poisson equation gives you a new potential. So now you have a new potential, you solve for new wave functions, you get a new density, you get a new potential. You do that maybe 10, maybe 20 times and things stop changing. The new potential is the same as the old potential. And at that point, you have what we call self-consistent wave functions and a self-consistent electronic structure. And that's huge for high energy density science because it means that you have not invoked anything like uh, Stuart Pyatt for um, your ionization potential depression. You, everything comes from the quantum mechanics. So it's a really well-constrained model. It still has some choices. You have to choose what you are gonna call your screening electrons. And depending on how you choose that, you can get different results from the rest of the stuff I'm gonna talk about, but not that different. And again, because uh, those choices are constrained, um, it can help you understand the uncertainties in your model from a really first principles point of view. Um, but once you make that choice, you can define an ion ion potential so that's not what an electron sees around one of these ions, it's what a neighboring ion sees if it runs into a neighbor. And that lets you, through a procedure um, developed by Charlie Starrett and Didier Simone, to um, get an ion structure that is again fully self consistent with your electronic structure. Uh, so, you know, it's not going to tell you the difference between BCC and FCC lattices, but it's, it will tell you the, the difference. BC between something that's close to melt and something that looks more like a plasma. So that's kind of cool. And when we look at the bulk properties from an average atom model like this, um, this was done with Purgatorio, the average atom model at Livermore. And we compare it to experiments. The red lines are recent experiments done um, on NIF and written up by Annie Critcher that reached gigabars of pressure. So this shows pressure as a function of compression. And it got up to really close to a gigabar, which is extraordinary. Um, we see that there's this weird shell structure. This is called a eugonio curve, uh, pressure versus compression. And this is called a nose of the eugonio, the maximum compression. And if you just treated your electrons as a fluid, you'd get that dashed line. That's a Thomas Fermi eugonio. And that's not what we saw in experiment. That's not what they measured at NIF. Instead, they measured this weird thing that sort of curves around that fluid model. And that's the effects of shell structure or this quantum mechanical nature of the electrons. So there's certainly shell structure in the experiment, those red curves. And the average atom DFT model does a pretty good job. It's the solid black line of describing that. And in fact, at modest pressures where things aren't too expensive for the Koncham DFT molecular dynamics, which is the orange line, um, the agreement is, is pretty good. So let's look at a little bit more detail. The cool thing about DFT MD or TDDFT or any of these alphabet soups of multicenter models is that um, they are almost as accurate ex as experiment, but you can also pull out really detailed information. So for example, you can look at something called the density of states. This is a calculation from my colleagues, Alina Kononov and Andrew Bishevsky. Um, and it shows you how the energy at which the 2s electrons are bound, the energy at which 2p electrons are bound in aluminum, and the structure of the, den of the free electron density of states. So we can compare that multicenter DFT model here titled KSDFT to the average atom DFT and see that they do a really good job um, overlaying each other. And it's not just for aluminum, which is a fairly simple metal, but it's for even more complex transition metals as well. You can use the wave functions and the information that you have here to generate things like dynamic structure factors. And these are interesting, it's actually a really um, deep concept. Uh, and so I won't do it justice here, but uh, if you've heard about X-ray Thompson scattering experiments used to diagnose warm dense matter, this is what they're doing. And TDDFT does it in a 
purely ab initio way. Um, it actually sends an oscillating um, X-ray field through uh, and models the response of the electrons. And it comes up with, with or aluminum at this temperature, at this scattering angle, this flat curve. Most of the models that we use in the community are based on the random phase approximation, maybe with some corrections and some other approximations for um, bound free features. And they would give you this um, dashed gray line. And you know, it's not bad. This is a log scale of but it's not good enough for diagnostics. But the average atom model, because we um, pay attention to what the wave, because we have the wave functions, uh, means that we can do a better job than many of the models currently used for warm dense matter diagnostics with X-ray Thompson scattering. And we can, depending again on the choice of uh, our screening potential or what we call free electrons, get really good agreement both qualitatively and quantitatively, where it really matters uh, with these TDDFT models. So that's cool. Um, but when we want to look at other observables like uh, monochromatic capacities or X-ray emission spectra, we find that density functional theory models, all of them, not just average atom, lack the detailed electronic configurations that you really need to do that kind of spectroscopy. So average atom, instead of having real integer occupied configurations for the electrons, just has one orbital for each atomic shell. So 1s, 2s, 2p. And those are occupied by some fractional number, some fictitious occupation. And if you try to do the transitions between them, there are only a handful of transitions. So this is L shell transitions in iron. This is these are lines from, you know, 3s to 2p and 3d to 2p and 3s, no, 3p to 2s, and so on. Um, and that's not at all what a detailed model would give you. A detailed model would give you the gray line. But what we've been able to do in the last couple of years is use again the self-consistent electronic orbitals from the average atom model and just employ standard atomic physics methods to split them into multi-configurations. And so when we do multi-configuration, hartree fock and add spin orbit coupling, um, we get really, really, really nice agreement with the more sophisticated collisional radiated models that are also based on sophisticated atomic physics, but only for isolated atoms. So this is kind of an exciting bit of progress. So far though, people have only done that for LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium. And while LTE is critically important, especially at low temperatures, when you get to higher temperatures, it's really, really difficult to create a radiation field with enough energy to enforce one of the conditions of LTE, which is that the radiation and electron temperatures have to be equal. And so if you wanted, for example, to know what fairly low density krypton at 500 eV, which is not that high a temperature, how it would emit, um, and you were constrained to LTE, you'd say, well, it's charged almost up to near helium-like. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, ions with two electrons, some that are lithium-like with three electrons, and its spectrum is going to be super bright, 10 to the 15 um, watts per square centimeter per eV, centered around 2.2 keV. Um, and that would be your prediction. That would correspond to some radiative energy loss that you might put into a hydrocode. And if you did, you would be catastrophically wrong because unless your radiation temperature is that high, which super difficult to do. What you'll actually see is a charge state distribution that's near neon light and a Z star that's around 24, an L shell emission that's much lower in energy and much less intense. So non-LTE is really important to be able to model both observables and just the bulk properties of, of experiments. Um, and we found a way now to do it where we have, you know, with reasonable accuracy, 
um, but rigorously consistent uh, wave functions to extend the range of those average atom models. Uh, I'll just touch on this very briefly. But as I mentioned, you know, it's one thing to generate the data, it's another thing to use the data. And so almost all of our hydro codes read in, they either use analytic equation of states and transport coefficients, or they read in tables of things like pressure, internal energy, transport coefficients. But those tables are two-dimensional. They're on um, density and temperature. And when you make things non-L to E, now you need to add another dimension. And actually you need to add thousands more dimensions because you need to know what every photon energy is doing in terms of its intensity in order to understand its effect on the um, atomic properties of your, of your atoms. So instead of doing infinite tables, which turn out not to be practical, surprisingly, um, we build tables that sample a pretty wide range of physically motivated radiation fields. And, and this is a talk or two in itself, so I won't go much through it, but we sample, for example, um, for a single temperature and density, a couple of points that have different optical depths and a couple of points that correspond to fluorescence where you have a hot source that's not that bright, but it, it's high energy enough to knock out interstellar electrons. And then we sample a couple of uh, photoionization cases, making sure that we capture LTE. Read in these tables, develop an interpolator. Um, this has been implemented in the Gorgon by Chris Jennings, which is super exciting. And then if you do radiation transport with those tables, we can recover uh, many of the features of a really high quality benchmark calculation done a couple of years by John Cruz and John Giuliani of NRL. Um, and again, if, if you just did the simple naive, I'm, pretend I'm optically thin, you'd be orders of magnitude wrong. If you just did LTE and the transport out, you'd be an order of magnitude wrong. But if you incorporate this tabular scheme, you can get a pretty good answer. That's the blue line as compared to the benchmark calculation. And finally, of course, um, we want to be able to apply this to experiments to understand what's happening with experiments. One of my favorite examples of this is returning to this maglev concept where you have a hot core that's radiating at a couple of keV, and those photons are going through a cold condensed beryllium shell. And as they do, they knock out inner shell electrons from the iron impurities that are in the shell, and they create these iron fluorescence lines. So you can, of course, create iron fluorescence lines in just a chunk of iron that you put on your desk and irradiate with a Nansen source of hot electrons, and you'll get um, the black, or actually the gray solid lines. So you'll get K alpha one, K alpha two, you'll get a K beta line that's much less intense and has a little shoulder from satellites. Um, and that K-beta line will be at 70, 55 EV or something. When we did this measurement with Eric Harding's fabulous spectrometer, we saw a small shift in the K-alpha lines to the red, as you see in the light blue solid lines. And we saw a profound shift in the K-beta lines. And that was really surprising because K-beta lines never moved to the red. If you ionize iron at all from its cold ambient state, those K beta lines move to the blue. So measuring this redshift and this broadening was really interesting. We also saw an absorption edge, but instead of being a sharp absorption edge, like you'd see in ambient iron, it was smoothed out. Um, and that comes from a temperature broadening of the Fermi edge. So it's a really direct, connection to a thermometer. We were able with, this, with these data to um, explain with our model this uh, redshift. It came because you're, you're squishing more electrons into the iron atom, and that gives you some additional shielding that differentially affects the wave functions and binding energies 
of the levels involved in these transitions in such a way that you get a red shift. So in the same way ionization gives you a blue shift, a higher energies, by taking electrons away, when you put more electrons in, you get a red shift, lower energies. So this, this was beautiful data and a lot of fun to model. Um, and we were able to use it to diagnose the properties of the liner, which until then we didn't have any way to access that. Um, I'll just give a plug to my colleague, Pat Knapp, who is, uh, has a group of his own where they're working on machine learning efforts for analysis um, to bring in all of the sources of data, the spectra, the neutron yields uh, that we collect from each experiment and do rigorous and robust data analysis. So on the atomic modeling side, we want to develop this, it's pretty ambitious, but we're making progress, accurate, consistent, and complete model that's applicable across this entire um, atomic pressure, extreme conditions, high energy density science regime. Uh, I won't go over all of what we're doing again, but the idea is that if we start with a rigorously consistent model, extend it to new regimes, we can get everything we need from this one model, consistent equation of state, transport, opacity, and observable data. We can use those for experimental diagnostics and in simulations. And that reduces our reliance. You know, plasma physics is complicated and hard, and, and it's very easy to say, well, I'll take this approximation and this approximation and this bit of data and that bit of data. And we build Franken models again, because it's hard to do everything fully consistently and, and right. Um, but it's also hard to understand what the impact of that kind of Franken modeling is. So if you take the form factor approximation and one component of plasma approximation in the RPA, and you stitch it together with this weird concept called Z-star that has multiple definitions as we've seen, um, how confident are you in your prediction of uh, a yield from an ICF target. So there's lots of work to do. We'd love to have you join us. I will type this into the chat um, so you can follow this link. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the internships that are available here. So if you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have summer internships that are pretty easy to get involved with. You'll want to find somebody that you want to work with or mentor. Or if you don't know somebody that you'd like to work with at Sandia, you can just apply for the internship and they'll try to match you up with someone. Um, the application time for these is now for a 10 week summer internship. We've been doing them pretty much remotely and I think we'll continue that no matter what happens for people who wish to do it and who can. And if it works and if everybody's happy, uh, you can continue through the school year working part-time at Sandia. The two options, if you go to this website and click on internships and co-ops that I would recommend are Siri, Science of Extreme Environments, Research and Innovation. Um, that will give you connections to the Z facility and Pulse Power. Another really good one if you're mathematical and computational are, is called Titans and Martians. And so that's under this Titan subheading. This is it, computer science and cryptography and, and um, computer security, but the math and analytics portion of this has strong ties to Center 1600 and high energy density science. If you're a graduate student, you can look at the fellowships that we offer. Of course, Postdocs from non-named fellowships are a great option. And if you want, reach out to me, please, and I'll help connect you with somebody who shares your interests and can point to postdoc postings when they come up. The fellowships are a little more formal. You have to write a proposal, but they come with their own LDRD funding. So all of the atomic physics work that I talked to you about was funded by an LDRD that I got that I'm able to support part-time a couple of people and we uh, have developed a, a nice strong working group, you'd have your own funding. So you'd be able to do just that for two to three years. Uh, the applications run from November to January and start early October. 
but the time frames are pretty flexible. Um, the Truman Fellowship uh, is is one of the most prestigious ones. It runs for three years and uh, focuses on any field. You can be a chemist, you can be a computer scientist, um, but you will have to have a couple of good papers and strong letters and a good GPA. The Ruby Fellowship is similar. It's a general fellowship that awards technical excellence, um, but it's named after Jill Ruby, the first woman who led a national lab, and it has a leadership component. So that means that you'll have regular meetings with um, senior lab management opportunities to go to DC. It is aimed to improve the opportunities for women in leadership. There's also the von Neumann Fellowship, which is primarily computational, and a new fellowship called the Maxwell Fellowship, which is uh, rehabs, that's radiation effects and high energy density science. So that's very much um, matter at extreme conditions, center 1600. That's one I'd, I'd really recommend you look into. Probably too late to apply now. I think the deadline is January 10th for this year's cycle. Uh, but if you're interested in maybe uh, making that deadline, please reach out to me. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Feel free to go ahead and unmute, or you could type a question in the chat if you want to. 